I did have a thought of looking at something different today. And, you know, we might do that later on. But, but we'll look at Romans chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, Lord willing, today. And when Peter wrote about Paul's writing, he said he wrote some things that were difficult to understand. I think this passage falls in that category here. The, me and I were discussing a little bit Wednesday night. <clears throat> but if you recall from our last lesson, we saw how the sin, the law itself is not sin, but it shows us our sinfulness. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we ended the lesson. And he continues on that same thought here in verse 8. He says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, brought me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law the sin was dead, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. He begins here by saying, But sin. <coughs> That sin always corrupts more and more, doesn't it? Amen. It's much like if you left cancer untreated, it would just grow and grow and <coughs> consume the body. <coughs> or if you have an item that's rusted, and if you leave it without taking care of the rust, the rust will consume that item. Sin is much the same way it will just consume more and more until it corrupts every bit of what it touches. Amen. I mean, well, he had, had said in, in the previous verse that he had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. The problem was not with the law, it was with sin as we see here and we'll see really for several more verses here. But, but sin, he says, taking an occasion by the commandment is taking opportunity with it. So the law or the commandment as he calls it here he gave sin the opportunity to show itself for what it really was mm -hmm. we have all been under the sin curse since Adam and Eve fell in the garden but when the, we have a, a commandment that says thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do that it shows us very plainly our sin mm -hmm. I think that's why so many today want to let's get rid of the Old Testament altogether just because it shows man his sinfulness. Amen. Certainly God is love, certainly he is gracious and merciful and long suffering, but I hope if you get nothing else from my teachings, you'll get that man is sinful in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. The law shows us that. The law was to point us to Christ. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Paul raised. Because we are sinners by nature. And the commandment, as he calls it here, it just illuminates that sinfulness that we already have within us. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, he says, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Or, like, word concupiscence it means lust or covetousness. It brought all sorts of Lust and covetousness about. And really, concupiscence is taking that lust to the extreme. So that's what sin by the commandment did, was just bring us all sorts of lust in and covetousness. And mm -hmm. according to Ephesians 2 3, we all walk and follow after those lusts and desires of the flesh before we were saved. Sometimes, just for your reference, concupiscence will refer to irregular sexual lust. But I think here he's just talking about lust to the extreme. Mm -hmm. That's by nature what we all were before the Lord saved us. Or if you're not saved, that is still by nature what you follow today is the lusts and desires of the flesh, as it's called in other places. Until God makes us a new creature, we will continue to follow after the lust and desire of the flesh. Amen. Because that is exactly what sin does. It just multiplies more and more sinfulness. And beginning from here in our next part of the verse through verse 10 is 
where it gets a little more confusing, I think. He says, for without the law, sin was dead. From this point, some people argue the age of accountability, and I can see how they come to that conclusion, but I don't think that's what Paul is speaking of here. But he says, for without the law, sin was dead. If you recall, we dealt kind of with this back in chapter 5 a bit. We can turn back there real quick to chapter 5, verse 13 through 14. And he was talking about how that all have sinned. He says in verse 13, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam and Moses, even over them that had not sinned at the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was a figure of him that was to come. Amen. So from the time of Adam to Moses, there wasn't a written down law of God, but yet sin still reigned very clearly. Well, Larry, can you think of two pretty large events that happened between Adam and Moses that sin was a major factor in? Mm. A lot of them. Well, there's two that stick out to Noah. me. Noah. Noah's day, the flood, and then Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. God very clearly judged sin in those two situations, and yet they were in that time between Adam and Moses. So sin was very much alive and well in that sense. Right. Sin was plenty active, we know, in Noah's day, because it says that even the imaginations and the thoughts of their hearts were even, only evil continually. Amen. God so hated the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah that once Lot and his family just got far enough away, he rained down fire and brimstone upon them. Amen. It's my understanding that the, where those cities were is now under the Dead Sea where nothing can live anymore. So he's not saying that there was, that because the Mosaic Law was in, in effect, there is, sin had no effect. It's, because we know that every man has the law of God written on their hearts and their conscience. Mm -hmm. But no, I think he's more referring to his own life, his, how that there was a time in his life he didn't have a, you could say, a spiritual understanding of the law. Therefore, to him, sin was dead. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians fifteen fifty six says that the strength of sin is the law. Like I said, the law itself is not sin. We saw that last week. But yet the law shows us our sinfulness. Yeah. Some have said that it taught us even how to be a better sinner. That was right. The law told us, well, you shouldn't do this. And in our rebellious nature, we do it. Where it says, thou shalt do this. And in our rebellious nature, we don't do it. He says the law, for without the law, sin was dead. I thought Brother John Gill wrote on this was good. He says, but when the apostle was without the law, that is, without the knowledge of the spirituality of it, before it came with power and light into his heart and conscience, sin lay as, it, as though it was dead. It was so in his apprehension he fancied himself free from it and that he was perfectly righteous. If you know anything about Paul's life before his conversion, he thought himself to be righteous in me. Right. Along with really all the rest of the Pharisees, they thought themselves to be not just pretty good, but really good in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. I know it's a familiar passage, but I'll read it for our remembrance here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Paul writing about his, his testimony to him before he was saved. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. And then he lists all these things he could boast about in the flesh. He says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal. 
persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You know, verse 7 says, but what thing were gained to me, though they kind of lost for Christ. Amen. Was that See, Paul was a very good Jew, wasn't he? Before right. he was saved. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law inside. Now he knew exactly how to look good in front of everybody else. And no doubt he was probably like the rest of the Pharisees and taught himself to be really righteous and really good and really knew something. Like we're in Luke chapter 18. I can't quite quote all of that, so I'm reading for us. Luke 18. We have the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. I'm going to pray. Luke 18, verses 10 through 14 here. Christ speaking, he says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. There he stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I pass twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing far off and not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and him that humble himself shall be exalted. Amen. He was a, to the public, and he thought he was, he thought sin was dead in his life, didn't he? And he didn't have a right understanding of the law. The Pharisees, they, they knew the law mentally, if you will, inside and out. Really, an atheist can go to seminary school, the atheist can get a, a Bible degree or theology degree, but yet it doesn't mean he knows God, does it? Right. Really, it was the same with the Pharisees. They they knew the commandments. They knew how to be a good Jew, how to look good in the sight of man. But yet, the publican is the one who really understood the law for what it was. Mm -hmm. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Have a right understanding of the law of God and really of His grace and so on. We, and not brag one bit about what we are or what we have done. Amen. If you know back in Philippians, Paul would later say that he wanted to be found not having his own righteousness, but which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Mm -hmm. So there is a quote righteousness which is in the law. But it's not a perfect righteousness as much as the Pharisees thought it was. You know, in another place in the gospel, Christ condemned the Pharisees because they, you know, they gave tithes and different things. They did all these things, but yet, because they left off the way to your matters of the law of faith and judgment and mercy. They did lots of things to look good in front of everyone else, but. In the sight of God, their heart was still corrupt. Right. I think that what Paul is getting at here, back in our text, that if he thought himself to be righteous before he had a right understanding of the law, we go on to verse nine. He will say, "For I was alive once, or I was alive without the law once." That is, not that he had spiritual life, or rather in his own mind he was alive and doing well. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he thought, wasn't it? Right. What all the Pharisees thought. I'm doing real good, God. I don't need anything else. I'm not as these publicans are. Why? He was a very zealous Pharisee. And he persecuted the church of God. He killed people, threw them in jail. He thought he was doing God's service. Right. In that sense, he was very much alive in his own mind to God. And yet, he would come later to realize that he wasn't very much alive at all. Right. Like he was dead spiritually. Isn't that kind of the way most people think about themselves the other day? Mm -hmm. They're all right. They're doing good. But they don't need 
Some of you would say they don't need God. Right. This is what I was thinking of looking at this in more detail, and maybe we will next week or two, but there's a ministries out there that do a study called the State of Theology. There's a survey of American people and what they believe about major theological things. And there's some very troublesome findings in there, even among professing Christians. But here's a few that they have to say regarding our topic today. 70% of Americans believe that they are born innocent in sight of God. Only 25% believe that even the smallest of sin deserves eternal damnation. Mm. And 66 percent of Americans believe that every one sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Mm. See, at least as far as Americans are concerned, we think we're all right. Right. In their eyes, they are alive before God, and yet they can't see that they are spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. But he says, but when the commandment came, was that is when the commandment came into his heart, when it became real to him. And I think that's why Christ said it was hard for thee to kick against the pricks when he, when he came to him and the, there on the road to Damascus. I don't know how long it transpired between the time when he was a young man holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen and the time that. Christ came to him there on the road to Damascus, but I feel quite certain that the Holy Spirit was convicting him, Amen. pricking him, if you will. And at some point, that's when the commandment came real to him, when he saw himself for what he really was. Right. We see in the life of Paul a radical change, don't we, from the, from the very self-righteous Pharisee to calling himself the chief of sinners. No, I don't. He does here refer to the commandments. I'm not sure if that. He seems to be thinking of a particular commandment that spoke to him. But I'd say for most of us, we would probably have some particular thing that stuck out to us, didn't we? Right. So that word commandment does mean an individual commandment. Sometimes it's used to refer to the whole law, sometimes it's used to. Could be used to refer to the, the first commandment, which was not to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But whatever Paul has here in mind, it became real to him when he saw himself for what he was. Mm -hmm. Because as he, as he'll say here in just a moment, that sin revived and he died. Sin revived doesn't mean that sin wasn't there, sin was already there. Right. Brother Larry's an earth. If he was to revive someone, he doesn't give them life, he's just bringing them back, if you will. Mm -hmm. See, sin has always been there in our lives. But until you really see yourself for what you are, you won't have a realization of the sin that's in your life. There's, so as we just pointed out, there's countless numbers of people today that live in their lives thinking they're okay with God. They don't see themselves as a sinner. They don't see themselves as worthy of condemnation in His sight. And yet, it won't be until that like, law, if you will, is made real to you that you will see yourself for what you are. Right. Sin revived and He died. All that self-righteous He had was worthless then, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Being of the being a Hebrew of Hebrews didn't mean anything. Being of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin, that didn't mean anything. Being circumcised the eighth day, that didn't mean anything. Amen. Being a Pharisee, being as touching the righteous within the law, blameless. All that zeal he had, it was all dead in a sense. You know, once, really once your spiritual eyes are open, that's exactly how you'll see yourself as well. Mm -hmm. you well, know, I know God deals with each other, each one of us individually. Sometimes people see their self as a sinner 
on the way to hell. Sometimes people see themselves as a sinner in the sight of an almighty God. Sometimes people see themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. We know from John Edwards that some people saw themselves as sinners in the hands of an angry God. Right. However it can be, I think it's very vital to the salvation that you see yourself as a sinner. Because only then will you know you need a Savior. And Romans 3.23 tells us, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Mm -hmm. You can know all about the law, all about the Bible, all about the scriptures. You can, so you can go to a seminary, even have a PhD in theology, but yet until that law was made real to you, you won't have a real understanding of your sin. Amen. That's what the Pharisees missed by a hundred miles, it seems like. They spent their entire lives studying the law and all about it and all the traditions of the Jews. And yet naturally they could not see their own sinfulness. I think that is really what Paul is conveying here that until the law is made real in your life, until it's, your understanding is illuminated, you will not see yourself as a sinner in the sight of God. Right. And then when it is made light unto you, then you can't see yourself anything but a sinner in the sight of God. Amen. Hey, Let's go on to verse 10 here. We'll try to bring this to a close. I'll make a few more comments before we close it up and put in the commandments. So whether this is the law as a whole or certain commandments, I'm unsure, but he says, which was ordained to life. You know the original command given to Adam and Eve was really for life, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Genesis 2, verses 16 through 17, we don't have to turn there, but if they were to break that commandment, they would surely die. Mm -hmm. And we know that of course, the serpent beguiled Eve, and she had eaten, gave to Adam, he did eat. If they had kept that command, we would have lived on eternally with, in a perfect, sinless state. Amen. In a very much a literal sense, it was for life, that commandment. But even the Mosaic Law was, in a sense, for life. Deuteronomy 8 1 and Leviticus 18, verse 5. I'm not going to turn it over time sake, but. You can read them in your own time this week. But they speak of the law of God being for life. I think that's more in a, a physical sense for Israel, that they were they would have a, a blessed and prosperous life in the land of Canaan, that they would keep mm -hmm. the law of God. Even though we even know that the commandment of honoring your parents is given with the promise that you might have a long life. Amen. But yet, we know that there is no law like give physical or spiritual life. I do want to turn over to Luke chapter 10 and read the word of Christ here. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. I imagine we've all heard this scripture before. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, speaking of Jesus, said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he, the lawyer, answering, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Jesus said to the Lord, Thou shalt thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Well, if you know the rest of the story there. The lawyer tried to justify himself. He said, right. Ask who is my neighbor? And we have a, what we call a parable of the Good Samaritan. But even Christ said, if you do those two things, you should live. The problem is we can't keep those two things, can we? To love God with really every part of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. On those two things hang all of all the prophets, the other scripture says. Amen. 
but yet we would have to keep those in perfectly for life to even possibly come from them. But we know from Galatians 3.21 that there is not a law that can give life because we cannot keep it perfectly. If there was a law that can give life, Galatians 3 says, then righteousness would come by the law. Christ is dead in vain. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is we are sinners in the sight of God. We, we break the least of the commandments. We're guilty of all of them. Amen. So yes, if you could keep the law perfectly, it would give, it would be for life. Mm -hmm. That Christ, you know, Christ kept perfectly. And had he not willingly laid down his life, he would have never died. Mm -hmm. But we by, are sinners by nature, therefore we are violators of God's law by nature. Mm -hmm. Amen. And even if we didn't have that sin nature, when we were born, we would we soon go after breaking God's law very early in our life. So let's go back to our text and bring this to a close here where he says, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. So that commandment which was which was good and which was holy and which was just, he says, I found it to be unto death because he is a violator of it. Mm -hmm. Because he is a transgressor of God's law, therefore he found it unto death. He says, now well, verse 11 and 12 kind of tie in this, but we're not going to. We'll get into those the Lord willing next time, but the commandment isn't what brings about death, but yet it's our violation of that law that brings about death. Amen. The law just tells us that we are guilty in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. But sin, sin is a problem. So verse 11 starts out for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceive me and by it slew me. Sin is the problem, it always has been the problem since Genesis chapter 3. Until Christ returns and death and hell and sin are all cast in the lake of fire forever, then until that day, sin is going to be the problem. Amen. And you must see yourself as a sinner in the sight of God and plead to Christ. That is really the only solution. I did mention there are some other beliefs on these verses here that some use it to argue the age of accountability. And I can see how they come to that, but yet the problem is we are all born sinners by nature. We all Amen. go very early into transgressing the law of God. Even just even if it's as simple as disobeying our parents. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it says for without the law sin was dead. That is they would argue that before we had an understanding of the law, we were not dead spiritually. You know, when sin, when that understanding came into our life, and we were dead spiritually. But I don't see anywhere else in Scripture where that points to that. We're right. all born as a wild asses to cult is what Job writes. Right. And we're all rebellious as soon as we're born. The wicked go forth from the mother's line. Wounds speaking lies, the scripture says. Mm -hmm. But even if that were the case, we very, very early in life become sinners in the sight of God. Right. But, you know, one could argue that very little children don't have a proper understanding of their sin. And then some people might argue that this is referring back to the us and Adam. When we were in Adam and he sinned in the garden, and I could see how they come to that too, except for when he says sin revived, because sin was not there until Adam sinned. Mm -hmm. But either which, no matter what our interpretation of this particular passage is, we know that sin is the problem, and sin must be dealt with. And I hope, if nothing else, from all of our studies in Romans, we see that, that sin is the problem. Sin must be dealt with, and that can only be through the person of Christ. Amen. Go ahead and close with that thought.